under a constant threat of intruders. You can't see them because they are extremely small. Organisms that fill the air you breathe and the water you drink. Bacteria, viruses, and parasites. They're often harmless, but some want one thing only, to infect your body. And these intruders have developed many successful methods for deceiving your defenses. But scientists are working hard to protect you. With the latest DNA technology, the most advanced microscopes, and the fastest supercomputers, researchers in Sweden are set on stopping those disease-causing microorganisms that threaten you. We start by looking how they fight bacteria. Here at Karolinska Institute, Brigitte Henriquez Normark conducts research on a mysterious bacterium, Pneumococcus. Many common bacteria live peacefully inside our bodies but others can cause diseases. We are studying different properties of the bacteria that could influence how the bacteria can cause a disease. Of course, we're looking into the properties by doing sequencing, uh, where you can look into the DNA of the bacteria. Uh, but we're also using, for example, cell culturing, looking how the bacteria can attach to different cells, uh, or microscopy, where we can look into different surface structures of the bacteria. And it is when they study the bacterial surface they have a major breakthrough. Pneumococcus are special. They are found in completely harmless forms in our body. They can be spread through sneezing or close contact between people. But then the bacterium can suddenly change and cause both pneumonia and meningitis. Something happens to the bacteria and Brigitte's team makes a surprising discovery. So here you have a pneumococcus, the bacterium, and here you see these pillars-like structures that are protruding from the surface of the bacteria that we are studying. They found that the dangerous variant of the bacterium developed pilus, a hair-like appendage on its surface. We thought it was very intriguing when we found that these bacteria can have these surface structures on their surface. So we were very interested to find out what is the role played by these pili in infectious disease outcome. Hello. Guys. Hello. Hello. So um, it's the project for Jan Willem, and now we yeah. made these mutants in the mm -hmm. 19Fs. After several years of research, they are now starting to realize just how important this pilus is. We found that the, this pillus is important for how, for how the bacteria can cause uh, pneumonia uh, in living organisms, but also how the bacteria can penetrate the blood-brain barrier and go into the brain and cause meningitis. Their latest discovery concerns how the bacteria enters the brain. The brain's blood vessels are actually protected from bacteria by a barrier. But the pilus of the dangerous bacteria searches for receptors on the barrier surface that help it enter the brain, where they can cause meningitis, which can be fatal. Now, with the new findings, Brigitte hopes to prevent this. We could potentially use this uh, as a treatment option, thereby we could block this entrance of the bacteria through the blood-brain barrier to go into the brain and, and meningitis. And that we have seen in living organisms, that we can actually do this. Brigitte's discovery of the pilus is one of the many new discoveries of how bacteria fool our bodies. There are bacteria that can even set up house inside our immune system, i.e. living with the enemy. Here at the Biomedical Center at Lund University, scientists want to solve the mystery of one of the most cunning bacteria. 
William Agues is an expert on our immune cells, the heroes of the body. And Frederick Carlson specializes in its opponent, the clever mycobacteria that kill 1.5 million people each year with a disease called tuberculosis. So one thing that is special with mycobacteria is that they live inside of immune cells whose normal job it is to kill off things. How it does that, we're not clear about. We believe that it's able to manipulate our immune system or change our immune cells so that they don't function in the proper way. Tuberculosis is a serious disease that mainly affects the lungs. When a person with the infectious tuberculosis coughs, droplets containing the bacteria are ejected from the body, which you risk breathing in. When it enters your body, the mycobacteria meets your innate immune system, consisting of white blood cells that eat up bacteria. But the mycobacteria go past this defense and is then faced with your next wall of defense, the adaptive immune system. It consists of immune cells that learn how the bacterium is constructed and creates a specially designed resistance. This kills most bacteria, but mycobacteria bypass this as well and settle sneakily inside the type of immune cells called macrophages. And I think we're still trying to work out what the cellular molecular mechanisms are of how the mycobacterium is able to survive in the host when there's a, an immune system present. Hi, Julia. Hey. How's it going? Good. Have a look at that. Ah. So you have the macrophage. Yes. Bacteria in green. Mm -hmm. That's a really nice That's picture. Nice picture right? yeah. We're specifically interested in, in figuring out exactly which type of immune cell do they actually reside in during infection. And how are the normal functions of those immune cells manipulated by the bacteria? This is a mystery that researchers have been trying to understand for a long time. Previously, bacteria were studied mostly in test tubes, but Lund's research team uses new technology to study the bacteria inside living organisms. And one of the key techniques we use is called flow cytometry. And this allows us to look at the immune cells and the types of immune cells that are around the bacteria or that are engulfing the bacteria. And so it's a technique that enables us to characterize exactly which cells are there, but it also allows us to say which of these cells are infected and which are not. This technique is giving new answers, and one of them is totally unexpected. Well, one of the surprising findings we had was that we were expecting the bacteria to infect a certain type of cell called a macrophage, based on previous literature and our previous knowledge. But what we found was the bacteria could infect multiple types of immune cells, not just these macrophages. So the bacteria are actually settling in completely different immune cells than previously thought. Cells that previously have not been studied in connection with tuberculosis. And this has not been explored previously and not known. And so we're super interested in understanding more in specifically what type of cells are these, uh, how do they contribute to the infection, and how do mycobacteria manipulate these cells, and how does that affect the infection process? In Lund, the scientists are now in full swing, studying these new immune cells. They hope to get a better picture of how the tricky mycobacteria infect the body and with that, knowledge of how we can fight tuberculosis. In addition to bacteria, there are other sly intruders that can infect your body. Colds, winter stomach bugs, and the flu are all examples of viruses. At Uppsala University, we meet Peter Casson, whose research is focusing on the influenza virus. 
My research is all about understanding how viruses get into cells, especially influenza virus. But what can we learn both about influenza and that's more general to understand this fundamental process and to be able to use it to try to prevent viral infection. Viruses are tiny, just one hundredth of the size of bacteria and not even their own life form. They therefore use our cells in order to multiply. They pass through the cell's walls, the membrane, and release their own DNA, which then uses the cell's own machinery to produce new virus particles. But Peter wants to put a stop to this. At the point when the virus tries to get into the cell, this is when the viral membrane is just opening to let the genome out and into the cell. So this is the moment we've been waiting for. This is what we're most interested in because we want to understand what has to happen to let this occur. Peter's team conducts various experiments with the virus and studies the progress through a fluorescence microscope. Every dot on the screen is a virus. And when the virus enters a cell, then something happens. So we can see when the virus releases its genome into its target because the fluorescent spot gets brighter. If we take a virus that has a slightly different protein, we know, does it take a little longer? Is it faster? Do not all the viruses work as well? And so we can monitor this one virus at a time. Peter uses the information from this experiment for the next step in his research. He has a special interest in advanced computer simulations where he builds up the virus atom by atom. The simulation gives new insights about the infection. What we can learn from them are the details of how the virus interacts with the cell membrane and what are the changes that could either permit the virus to enter or stop it from entering. But this comes at a cost. It takes a long time to program each simulation, followed by a long wait. Even though the calculations are made with very powerful supercomputers. So this simulation runs for quite a long time, and it looks like it will finish half a year from now. So these, these simulations are very large and take quite a while. This wait, however, can be profitable. The goal is to stop the passageway of the virus into our cells, and thus an end to the flu. But your body is also exposed to another kind of resourceful microorganism, parasites. They can be found in the food you eat or the water you drink. A parasite lives in, gets nourishment from, and is destructive to its host. Amoebas, pinworms, and fleas are parasites, but one of the most deadly, which is spread by mosquitoes, is the malaria parasite. Malaria kills more than 400,000 people every year. Here at a lab outside Cambridge in England, we find a researcher who wants to change that. His name is Oliver Bilker. So these are our malaria mosquitoes. They are very hungry. And you can tell because they will be moving towards my hand We can put our hand in, but we've got to be quick so that we don't get bitten. We want to gain a really deep understanding of the biology of the parasite. 
We want to understand how it causes disease, how it evades the immune system, how it can develop inside a mosquito, um, and how it can be passed on to the next person. The malaria parasite has a unique ability to live in both mosquitoes and humans because the parasite transforms depending on where it finds itself, in the mosquito's saliva or in our red blood cells. The answer to how this is achieved lies in the genes of the parasite, but the malaria parasite is difficult to study. What is hard is to find functions for genes. We can read the genome and find the genes, but since the parasite is so different from any organism we understand well, we cannot predict what all the genes are doing. The malaria parasite has long haunted scientists. Here you see the parasites shining green inside the mosquito's body. Wow, that is a really heavy infection. Yeah. Are they all like this? Yeah, a lot of them are. But now Oliver's team has managed to come up with a solution with barcodes on the parasite genes that reveal the activity of the genes. In a single big experiment that we call a genetic screen, we can now get a very complete picture of an aspect of the parasite's biology. With this new technology, they soon made a breakthrough discovery regarding the parasite's so-called essential genes, the genes that are essential for the survival of the parasite. We were very surprised to discover that there are very many essential genes in the malaria parasite's genome. The genome is highly optimized, like a Formula One engine. You cannot take anything away without it breaking. It means there are many, many targets for drugs uh, to be developed. This is just the first of many breakthroughs that are waiting when the genes are now mapped. But in the future, Oliver's discoveries will be made in Umu. The mosquitoes are moving north. We will have to move our mosquitoes and we will ship them up to Umu as eggs in the post. And we will have to move the content of three very big freezers uh, on dry ice uh, in many individual shipments also to Sweden. So this is now going to Umia. But this is a complicated move, to say the least. How is it organized? The move? Yeah. Oh, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, it is a bit messy. But once the mosquitoes are in place in Umil, Bilker's team will be able to expand their research on the mysterious genes of the malaria parasite. The goal is to one day completely put an end to this deadly disease. Because once the researchers find the weaknesses of a microorganism, they can use these to develop a new cure. Often this goal is in the form of a new vaccine. Here at the University of Gothenburg, Niels Licke and his team are researching vaccines. Vaccines are the only really strong instrument to protect against infectious diseases. And because uh, humanity is always uh, and constantly exposed to infections, the only way to create strong immunity in big populations are actually to vaccinate. Each species of a microorganism differs. With a vaccine, one uses exactly that which is unique to a specific organism. When our immune system meets the vaccine, the immune system creates a specially designed protection. Then, if we later come across the real disease-causing microorganisms, we already have a functioning defense that keeps us healthy. So most vaccines are actually very long-lived and are 
the best health uh, insurance that uh, is seen globally. But today, vaccines are usually given with syringes, which requires a lot of logistics with shipping, refrigeration, and medically trained staff. A simpler solution would be if you could take vaccines as a nasal spray or drink the vaccine as a regular medicine. Then the protection would also be better in that part of the body that first meets the diseases. And the most important component of a local vaccine is that it gives local protection, whereas the injectable vaccine doesn't really give local protection. The problem is that the immune system in the nose and stomach does not respond sufficiently to normal vaccine. Something is needed to make the vaccine more powerful. An immune enhancer. Okay, uh, what we see in the screen is the whole vaccine that we are using. The red is the unique part of the virus that we want to protect against. The blue, however, is an immune enhancer, a molecule taken from the cholera bacterium, which causes a very strong immune response. To get even more effect, Neil's team has also developed a specifically designed nanoparticle that carries the vaccine into the body. Okay, so this is a nanoparticle. It's basically a sphere made of fat with a hole inside. The vaccine attaches to the particle that is perceived as foreign by the body and causes the immune system to react extra vigorously. The particle is actually a way to uh, mimic how bacteria are perceived as uh, a risk factor. And uh, when the particle is delivered as a vaccine, the body reacts as if it was a bacterial infection. The combination of the nanoparticle with the immune enhancer has already proven very successful in experiments with the flu vaccine. You have like ordinary vaccines that you can see these dark spots that are the killer cells that can kill the viruses and also infected cells. And then this is our new vaccine. So you can see so many of them over here that can kill so many viruses and also the infected cells. Their new way of packaging the vaccine will be capable of being used against many different diseases. The hope is to make vaccinations much easier and to stop diseases before they have had a chance to break out. Research to knock out infections is constantly progressing. As the researchers learn more and more about the microorganisms, they reveal their weaknesses and find new targets for vaccines. So even if we do live under a constant threat from microorganisms, trying to outwit your immune system, these threats are fewer and fewer thanks to the research and the new vaccines. Bacteria, viruses, and parasites will always be a part of our world. But the diseases they cause in our bodies, these can one day be a thing of the past.